Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and this is Sustainable Hawaii, airing every Tuesday at noon on thinktechhawaii.com. For decades, scientists worldwide have known that coral reefs, which are the breadbasket for over 500 million people, are being destroyed by development, overfishing, pollution, and increased ocean temperatures. In 1998 alone, a bleaching event caused by very warm water killed more than 15% of corals worldwide. For much of the 20th century, Kaneohe Bay was used as a sewage dump. By the 1970s, a majority of the bay's reefs that once provided food for thousands of people had died. Sewage dumping was eventually curtailed, leading to a temporary recovery, but then invasive algae took over and again suffocated the reef. In 2005, the State Department of Land and Natural Resources partnered with the Nature Conservancy and the University of Hawaii to remove most of the algae from the bay. The water cleared up and patches of reef began to grow again. But in 2015, unusually high water temperatures caused widespread coral bleaching. Actually in 2014, all around Oahu, and again in 2015, water temperatures in the bay spiked by almost four degrees Fahrenheit. These events set the stage for the phenomenal coral reef research being done by my guest today. I'm delighted to have back on the show again, the world-renowned coral biologist, Dr. Ruth Gates. Dr. Gates began her studies in her native England at Newcastle University, just inland of the North Sea. For years, she studied corals also in the Caribbean Sea. Today, she leads research as the director of the University of Hawaii's Institute of Marine Biology on Coconut Island in Kaneohe Bay, where she's globally recognized for her cutting edge work on corals. She was awarded the University of Hawaii Board of Regents Medal for Excellence in Research in 2014 was honored as the 2015 ARCS Foundation Scientist of the Year, and this year was identified as Islander of the Year for Science by Honolulu Magazine. Her work is the subject of several recent documentary shows on National Geographic, the Discovery Channel, and the American Museum of Natural History. That's where I first discovered her. Dr. Gates is the elected president of the International Society for Reef Studies, which held its International Coral Reef Symposium in the United States for the very first time right here in Hawaii in June. And she's about to participate in the World Conservation Congress starting this week. Aloha. Welcome, Dr. Gates. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm delighted to be back. Well, I'm delighted you're always willing to partake in these opportunities to share your work with the world. Absolutely. You're, you're certainly plastered everywhere now, <laughs> and we're all appreciative of it because there's always something new we're learning. Well, I, the one thing I'd like to say is that, you know, I follow my passion, I do what I love to do, and I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to pursue a career like the one that I have here at the University of Hawaii. Well, tell us so that the viewers who haven't seen you know exactly what your work is on Coconut Island. So I'm a coral biologist. I've been one for 25 years, and um, I've studied one feature of the biology that has become particularly important um, as climate change has intensified, and that is, why does one coral do better than another when they are stressed out? You know, and really, you can analogize that back to humans. When two people are faced with the same problem, often they respond very differently. And so my group and many others around the world has been focusing on the biology that underpins those differences in the ability of individuals to perform or even individual reefs to sustain damage. Um, and we think we've identified three characteristics. It's to do with their genetics, just like with humans. It's to do with their past experience. Have they survived a stress event in the past? And it seems that if they have, it makes them better able to withstand an event in the future. This is what I love about your work. Instead of focusing, as many of us have in the years trying to get people to pay attention to climate change, instead of focusing on the 70% of the corals that are stressed out or dying, you're focusing on the smaller percentage that are surviving and why. Absolutely, and I think that this is a, you know, I've, I've monitored the changes on reefs in, in the, over the course of my career. I've seen reefs that I have dove on and loved be annihilated by the actions of man. 
you can spend a lot of time documenting it and getting depressed about it. But my opinion is, if we do the science for a reason, that's to better understand the system, it's, it's really an imperative for us to actually take that knowledge and move that forward and think about how that knowledge is tells us about a feature that will be important to address as we move forward in ever more increasingly stressful conditions. And so let me just back up a little bit with that. Climate change is intensifying. The planet's getting warmer and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is, is increasing as we burn more fossil fuels. What that translates to in the ocean is warmer than normal seawater temperatures and a change in the chemistry of the water. That's something I learned recently. I didn't realize that the actual fossil fuels leaking in the water, yeah. as well as the That's CO2 right. they're emitting, is changing the chemistry. Exactly. Of the That's it's dissolving into the CO2 dissolves into the water and and it makes the, the, the water more acidic and that acidity coupled with temperature is now starting to interfere with very basic biological reactions that are critical to the maintenance of reefs. That is, their ability to actually build the structure that creates the reef, that protects the land directly behind them, and of course creates the home for all the things that live on reefs. And we've um, talked about on this show several times the importance of that reef as a barrier for the large wave events, the monster absolutely. waves that are eating away at our infrastructure that's so important to our economy as well. You know, this, this, this function of reefs as natural seawalls is something that actually doesn't often get much play. And, you know, we are living in a time where we're trying to react to what seem to be really urgent problems associated with sea level rise. And, you know, my perspective is if we take care of our natural seawalls, we it's a much to more, build them. That's right, it's a much more cost-effective uh, solution to rising sea level. If we can make our reefs survive into the future and continue to create these big structures that protect our land, then surely that is a much more um, appropriate action than pouring in an enormous amount of concrete. Absolutely, and one of the other things that I've taken in from all the different talks that you've given is that you really are about systems thinking and a systems mm -hmm. approach. Whereas most academics who are that deep into research as you are, are very stove piped mm -hmm. and are really focusing because it takes all their energy to do that. Somehow you've been coming out of that stove pipe and connecting the different kinds of research and the different ways in which policy can be developed using that research. You know, as an academic, as a trained academic, you are sort of forced down these stove pipes. Being an expert at something is, is really it, the way you get promoted through your career. I think, you know, I'm lucky enough to have gone through my career. I've done that. I've published a lot of papers in the peer-reviewed literature, but I could see that I'm more comfortable in the broader conversation of, I've got this knowledge, how do I combine my knowledge with the knowledge of others that may be quite different but very complementary? And then when you put all of that together, you end up with a pie that addresses a problem that we need to address as a society. And so I think that I have been lucky enough to sort of take the science forward into a more solution-oriented. Our, our projects right now are focused on harnessing our basic understanding of biology to develop corals that are provisioned for the future, that we know can survive the future. We call this an area called assisted evolution. It's very controversial. Yeah, I was um, going to say, when it applies to humans, people cringe. But what Do it, they have the same reaction when well, it applies to Well, you know, it's so corals? funny because I think that, you know, often I'll discuss it and say, well, do you have a dog? And people say, yeah, I have a dog. I say, well, what type of dog do you have? Golden Retriever. I said, that's great. That, did you know that that Golden Retriever was selected to look like a Golden right. Retriever? We breed things to create the look that we want for those dogs. And the behaviors that's that we right. want. And yeah. in the, the context of corals, then, one of the things that we're doing is saying, well, if we know that two individuals that are different individuals in the same species are doing really well, it's better to breed those two individuals than it is for them to randomly breed with somebody who's doing really poorly because through the process known as natural selection, that individual of the mixed positive and negative will probably not survive the future as well as a positive positive. Right, right. So it's not a radical thing that we're doing at all. We've done it with everything that we eat on our food, in our food supply. We do it with trees. We go to the garden center. Everything is selectively bred for the feature that we as humans deem important. And what I'm saying is why shouldn't we be doing this to help coral reefs? So when you 
worked with or presided yeah. over. I think you were one of the key people mm -hmm. to get the International Coral Reef Symposium here, correct? Yes. And so when you were involved in that, I know one of the principal goals of that symposium was to get out of the academic silos and start getting the attention of policymakers to yes. look at the science and get the academics to talk to the policymakers. That's right. Was that successful and, and what were the outcomes of that symposium? I, I think it was very successful and actually I think this is a conversation that our International Coral Reef Symposium was explicitly sort of contextualized by bridging science to policy and there was a leaders summit that brought some of our Pacific Island leaders to the table to discuss the needs of their islands and then convene it with scientists and science that could potentially meet those needs. Um, this conversation has been going on in a number of different arenas on the West Coast with the fisheries, very successful management, uh, very positive management of the fisheries. Um, I think it's what, what's happening is the problems with nature or the problems that are occurring because we've driven the planet down a pipe that is really scary with climate change. And we're now, we have this tension of developing the land and all that that means for the natural systems that are directly adjacent to them. The coral reefs are immediately adjacent to where we live. I think well, to where we live. Yes. But the problem is, is that so many pe in the people in the world don't live near coral reefs. So they don't have the appreciation yes. for how important the reefs are for our global ecosystem. Well, so how do we engage the people who don't have this immediate access and visibility to the reef so that they're aware that this provides basically the food source, the economic resource, yes. you know, tourism, other things well, that's that, right. are, that mean, is maybe, crucial for all of us. I mean, maybe the d most direct interaction between most people and a coral reef is, is really the drugs that are being developed from the organisms oh. that live there. And this is a, a smaller part of the picture that people don't often, we don't, we don't usually say, well, coral reefs do this for humans. They do medicines, coastal protection, food, tourist economies. We don't usually put the medicine at the top of the list, and yet probably if you look at the number of people affected by that particular service that the reef provides to humans, mm -hmm. it's many. Wow. Uh, very broad reaching. That. And so we don't really think about it that way. We often talk about the, the importance in terms of biodiversity and the maintenance of biodiversity. And I've often said to, to people, well, Biodiversity doesn't actually tell people what we mean. Really what we mean is the variety of organisms that live on the planet. And, and the eco-services right. that they provide for all that's of us. That's right. Are, do you, can you think of, give us some examples of some of the um, medicines that might come from the reef? So there's some medicines that are being developed that are for ca anti-cancer drugs. There's many, many, many scientists who are involved in taking small pieces of organisms off the reef and doing these ever more intense fractionations of the, 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 the homogenate. We basically mm -hmm. smush them up in a big tube and you look and see whether that's a bioactive thing. Can In a test, we're essentially growing cells from different cancers. You put this solution in and if it inhibits those cells growing, then you know it's an anti-cancer to that particular cancer. So how can we get folks to pay attention to that value in our public policy making yes. so that we translate the the incredible resource that is the evolving information about the reef because you're discovering new things every day. Right? Yes, well, you know, this is the sort of the field of biomimicry that if, if we understand the biology of these organisms really well, we see whether they serve us in a variety of ways. If the answer is yes, say with a drug, often what happens then is a pharmaceutical company will come in and will mimic the chemistry of that particular compound because you can't obviously go out and take a lot of things off the reef continually. But at that point, it sort of disconnects from the reef and you no longer know that that compound actually yeah. originated from a finding that was from a reef right. organism. So that tracing of how did we get to this end point, it's a little bit like the labeling in food. You know, people are always saying, we want to label yeah. the food. We want to know where it came from, whether it's genetically modified. It's the same kind of thing with drugs. We should know where those ideas and Absolutely. where that, that biology was first discovered. So that is, that gonna, people. is that going to take a policy change so that we require those now that to give origins? That would certainly take a policy change. And, um, and do you think that's feasible? 
I think it's very feasible. Uh, you know, another issue that has come to light very recently is the influence of sun, suntan lotions on mm -hmm. corals and the coral right. health, right. and that there are chemicals in those suntan lotions that are really poisoning corals. And because we have areas that are so heavily, heavily used by tourists, yeah, like one Kanala of the, Bay. the things that we try and demonstrate out at Camp Mokulaia mm -hmm. for our visitors is take your sunscreen hand, if you put it on the reef, the next day you will see the imprint of your hand right. where that reef is now, that coral is now bleached. That's right. People are astounded. They have no idea. That's right. And it's I think very if, we, if we can educate them, they won't be doing that. But how do we translate that into policy? Well, so, and you know, there's maybe I think we need to take a break oh, okay. and then we'll come back to that and say, how are we going to get this to make uh, a difference big difference in the policy realm? We'll be right back. Hey, how you doing? Uh, welcome to Abachi Talk. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm your co-host. And we have a nice program here every Friday at 1 o'clock uh, on Think Tech Studios where we talk about technology and we have a little bit of fun with it. So join us if you can. Thanks. Aloha. Aloha, everyone. I'm Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. Um, we are here to show you news, issues, and events local and around the world. Join me. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. Hi, we're back with world-renowned coral reef biologist, Dr. Ruth Gates, and we were just talking about the importance of translating the research into policy. And I know that you've been working with the local legislature on some issues that we might be able to make changes here. Yes, I and many others have been sort of um, highlighting things in the water that are, are actually causing problems with corals' health. And one that has come to light very, very recently is the is suntan lotions and the chemistry, uh, the chemicals that are in suntan lotions, which I should mention, if they're not good for corals, they're definitely they're not, good, not for good for us. That's right. Because we actually have evolved from a common ancestor of corals. So they are quite biologically similar to us. Um, so, huh. but what's happening is, is that science is basically being masked to show that the, the reef itself is not doing well in important ways. And that knowledge is now being moved into policymakers' hands to develop new bills to move through our local legislature. And I think eventually through federal um, policymakers to actually develop guidelines for how suntan lotions can be used and which ones can be used. And there's a particular set of, um, of chemicals that are really bad, and I think there's a real move to ban those chemicals. Um, what are some of those? They're oxybenzones. There is a particular cy a, a cyclical group of chemicals that just appear to stop corals from reproducing. And we know that endangered species are like the canary in the coal mine. That's right. And when they start to suffer, we know that we're going to be suffering. That's right. I mean, you know, humans, we rely on other organisms. We're part of the general biodiversity. We're not special. Right. Um, things that are going wrong for other organisms will eventually go wrong for us, right? We know that our health is being influenced. There's a lot of discussion of GMO. There's a lot of discussion about how environmental pollution affects our function. There's certainly uh, the know? increases in cancer and both the, the diverse number of cancer as well as the huge number of people that are coming down with it. It's, it's, yeah. it's kind of scary. Our world is a much more environmentally complex place and a lot of that complexity is man-made. It's stuff that we've developed that is now coming out into our atmosphere or being eaten by us. And, you know, one area that I think, you know, is, is so um, 
present for many people is plastics. You know, we mm. get talked about talking about, you know, removing plastic bags, but, you know, plastics go into the ocean, either in large or small pieces. Even if we collect them and recycle them, we're recycling them into another plastic-based product. That's and right. as you recycle, it becomes ever smaller and smaller and smaller. And now we know that microplastics are starting to appear in the internal organs of marine life. And it's only a matter of time before plastics inside our own bloodstream become an issue. Yeah, this is something actually that, that is very prevalent in Hawaii is when you, even when you're fishing and you c catch the fish and gut it, you see a lot of microplastics. One of the things that um, I think is really important that came out of the Coral Reef Summit is the legislation you were talking about for Hawaii. But is there also this move for legislation in other coral reef centered Absolutely. countries? And are they going to be coordinating with us? Are we going to be doing sort of an international or global effort to educate one another about what the policy solutions right. might be? I mean, I think that the, 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 the fabulous thing about reefs is they are global. They are distributed uh, around the middle or the belt of the planet. And What's so great about convening international conferences like the International Coral Reef Symposium or the, the World Conservation Congress is that essentially you're bringing players together to talk about success stories or failures in attempting to preserve natural systems across the globe. And so what that enables, that level of conversation is, is a much more coordinated effort to take really lessons learned that are positive, translate them rapidly to other places, to make more of a difference across more of the planet. And that's an exciting thing in which I think science and scientists are in that conversation very actively at the moment, saying our science tells us that this is the right direction right. to legislate, to do, generate policy around. Of course, every conference is only as good as what happens in between the conferences, and particularly right. the World Conservation Congress and the Coral Reef yes. Symposium are every four years. Yes. And we need to be abreast of and make sure that we push and pursue yes. the activity in between the Congresses so that there's that carry-on effect. Yeah. What is happening to make sure that? Well, that I mean, I would say from my own perspective, from the coral reef fields within this, this sort of smaller subset the, um, of the environmental settings that we would want to protect, um, we have an international society that is really now tasked with making sure our community advances agendas collaboratively. Okay. So we're really pushing a much more collaborative framework for our society, trying to engage specifically with our younger population of scientists who are very committed to doing something about the problems that are on and the And of course, right they're now. socially networked like never absolutely. before. And so there's many more avenues to keep that going than absolutely. we ever had as young students. And you know, as well as the social networking, there's much more technology that is being thrown at these problems than has ever been used before. You know, we have NASA coming in and funding really large scale acquisition of imagery on reefs for the first time. So ever. using satellite That's imagery right. satellite and sharing and that. then re retrofitting airplanes with special cameras to be able to fly over large areas of reef. There's a, a big project called Coral that's been, it's a $15 million project being pushed out from, from NASA focused on coral reefs. But and I understand that coral reefs, but maybe it's just the Great Barrier Reef, can actually be seen from space. Oh, absolutely. And many of the reefs in the world can be seen from space. I mean, which is an astonishing thing when you think that they're created by microscopic animals. Yeah, that have even tinier little plants living inside of them. I mean, that's an astonishing natural feat of biology that I think many people think that a coral is a rock and walk all over it thinking it's a rock because it looks like that. But actually, it's a dynamic living organism that is actually building that rock from and, within And it's itself. an organism that's a whole world unto itself. Exactly. Because one of the things you share in one of the many documentaries I've seen about you is is that every time you peel a layer, you see layers more of living organisms that are depending 
on a symbiotic relationship right. all the way through. They are masters of symbiosis, and that is the just the tight interaction by two very different organisms. And you know, symbiosis as a feature for humans is critically important. We'll, we'll all have talked uh, to each other over the, over the dinner table about what do we mean microbiome? What does that mean that the, the bacteria in our guts can potentially be beneficial to us? That is a symbiosis, and that symbiosis can be knocked off by a bad diet into something that makes us physically unhealthy. Same thing can happen in corals. When they change their symbionts, they can be basically transitioned into an unhealthy state. Again, exemplifying the tight linkage between the biology of humans and the biology of these rock-like creatures on the reef. So you've been working on these different new growth patches in Kaneohe Bay. Yeah. I'm wondering if you're going to get to take some of the World Conservation Congress folks out to show them the work you've been doing? So we do. We are entertaining quite a number of visitors, um, high-level visitors, policy makers, who are coming in to have a look at, at just the amazing resource that, you know, the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology is an, a marine institute sitting on a living coral reef, one of the patch reefs. There's about 50 of those in Kaneohe Bay. Being able to see the coral from where I work is an astonishing thing, and having the kind of infrastructure that we have on the island to do cutting edge science, acquire new knowledge that is really purposeful about why certain reefs are doing better than others and what that means for all the other biodiversity that uses all the fish and of course the marine mammals that use our coastal waters. So astonishing place. So we're hoping to, we are definitely touring. We have two press tours going on next week that we'll be involved in. One on Coconut Island with National Geographic, another one with the state talking about the state's plan for managing coral bleaching. As we move into, unfortunately, what looks like it's gonna be a third consecutive bleaching event in wow. 2016. We are already seeing signs on the reef in Kaneohe Bay that corals are changing from their characteristic dark brown color to much lighter white. Yeah, um, we're seeing that out on Mokulei on the reef as well. It's, awful. It's, it's really awful. So you're going to be bringing international scientists, but the press as well, out to see Absolutely. this. One of the things that's so astounding about your work in Kaneohe Bay is that you have a very accessible site in a large area for a lot of people, and we in Hawaii are smack in the middle of the Pacific that makes us very accessible, actually, despite our remoteness, yes. to all the Pacific countries that are key in this as the largest ocean and some of the biggest economies of the yeah. world. Yes. So will you be having China and Japan and other countries? It's very, very interesting. I already am hosting Chinese scientists in my group. Um, we have, um, we are a site for Fulbright Exchange, where we're inviting um, a, a scientists from all over the world to come. My perspective is we need to be collaborating with as many people from as many places as we can as we actually advance a plan for how we're going to respond to the problems on reefs. Not just watch them, but respond. Well, this is so exciting, and in the last 30 seconds, I just would like to thank you so much for coming on again, invite you to come back again after the Congress so we can talk about what your experience was with hosting these folks from around the world and hopefully learn more about the more uh, funding, international funding and state and federal funding that you're getting because I know you're getting much more support than ever before yes, as people realize this. Thank you so much, Kirsten. It's been a pleasure to be here. Delighted and wish you all the best in the World Conservation Congress. Aloha and join us again next Tuesday on Sustainable Hawaii. Mahalo.